Hi everyone, my name is Kasal Gunawardena, Elite Athlete Sports Physiotherapist. I'm uh, the Head of Sports Medicine at the University of Melbourne. Um, I've been uh, at the University of Melbourne since 2002 where I've had the opportunity to work with countless athletes and a countless number of athletes and um, I've been able to enjoy helping them achieve the very best results uh, in terms of tournaments, personal bests, medals uh, and uh, records as well. So um, I'm bringing this lecture to you today which are the five basic elements to provide effective treatment every single time um, because in, in my career, especially early on, I found that I was getting extremely good results on some occasions and under the same conditions or the same problems, I was getting substandard results. And I was thinking, well, what am I, what am I doing wrong? Or what else should I be doing to improve this? And in my career now, I've done over 35,000 treatments in sports physio alone. And I've been able to synthesize information and put that all together and look at the things that ultimately worked and look, look at the things that didn't work. So, I pulled out all the things that have worked and put it all together and share, I'm sharing that with you under the five basic elements uh, that allow you to get effective results uh, or effective, uh, to provide effective treatment uh, every time you treat. So, uh, there, there's been a lot of uh, heartache that uh, went into me learning all of this. Uh, if I can reduce that heartache for you, I think I would have done my job then. I hope you enjoy this lecture. Uh, it, I'm, I thoroughly enjoy bringing this to you. And, um, um, well, without further ado, I, uh, I tend to waffle on a bit, but I'm not going to do it now. Without further ado, let's get into the lecture. These are the five basic elements to provide an effective treatment every single time. Um, as I go through this lecture, you will find that the five basic elements are things that you've learned at university or during your training or at college. But there's elements uh, or things that I've found within those elements that can make a big difference for you. And if you continue to do those things that uh, I'm going to share with you, uh, you'll find you will be able to get very, very good results uh, as a practitioner and you'll be able to get very good results as a therapist and you'll be able to help your athletes very, very quickly. So let's get started. I just want to say what effective treatment is. Let's just start with this first. Effective treatment is all about getting the best results in the shortest period of time. So you're getting that within that. And when you are doing that, you are showing your prowess as an excellent, uh, excellent practitioner. You're getting effective treatment and the person that benefits is your athlete. One thing I'd like to add here, and this is a redefinition of treatment excellence now. Treatment excellence is getting the wow factor. How do we get the wow factor? You get the wow factor by getting the best result in the shortest period of time and you go the extra mile. Going the extra mile is everything about your personality everything about you as a person, everything about finding things that could be clinical, non-clinical, so things about you know personality. It's all about the things that might not be expected, your, your athlete might not expect it, but you provide that anyway. So 
treatment excellence, best results, shortest period of time, and you go the extra mile. In Australia, when we have overseas trained practitioners coming to Australia, there's a set of exams that they have to do. There's a written exam. Uh, there's, um, I believe, three um, practical exams. Within these exams, and especially the practical ones, there's four things that the Australian Physiotherapy Council look at to see whether they are a practitioner that can work in Australia. The first thing is safety. Whether the person is safe, or whether the practitioner is safe with that person in terms of the assessment, in terms of the treatment uh, thereafter. Whether the treatment's effective. Whether there's exercises given. And the final one is whether the person, whether the patient ultimately wants to go back and see that therapist. You need to be able to give all of these four things during these practical exams. If you miss out on one, you fail. If you get all four, obviously you pass. But you can't miss out on any one. If you miss out on any one, you, you literally fail. Why do I bring you this? Because this gives you the very basics of what is required in Australia. But it also gives you the basics of what is required with providing a wonderful treatment and providing a wonderful service. Mind you, there are different criterion under safety. There's different criterion under effective treatment. There's different criterion under exercises. There's different criterion under, you know, I want to go back, whether they want to go back. So the, the examiners will check all that. But these are the four basic elements they look at, or the four uh, broad areas they look at. Now, <clears throat> let's get to the elements. What are the five elements that are required to provide the best treatment every single time? These elements, you would have learned all of this at university. I'm not recreating the wheel here. The five elements are your subjective assessment, your objective assessment, analysis of one and two, your treatment, and finally the education. These are the five basic elements. What I'm going to go through now is at each, uh, at each element, I'll be sharing with you what has gotten me results. Uh, I'm going to share with you things that you should concentrate on, things that you should avoid, and things that could make a big difference for you, because they helped me during my career. Let's start with the subjective. When a person comes in, one of the first things uh, a person, the uh, first things the, the patient will tell you or the athlete will tell you is that they're in pain. That is the only reference point they have that they've got something wrong with them. What I'd like to share with you and what I'd like to tell you is that you shouldn't, you as a practitioner, shouldn't use that as your reference point. When a person comes in, uh, let's call them Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith comes in and says, Casal, I've got this low back problem. No, they might say, I've got this low back pain. Most uh, patients come in and tell you that they're in pain. Back in the day, the old school, old school thinking was, okay, let's rate this pain out of 10. Let's get, uh, let's try to understand this pain a little bit more. That might be important, but far more important is to put less emphasis on the pain. Why do I say that? Because there's a few other things I'm going to share with you in the next few slides. <clears throat> and that will make this 
uh, statement a little bit clearer. When we start to concentrate on pain, pain is something that people are going through. As I said, it is their reference point. They are coming to you because they say, well, I don't know what's wrong, but there's some kind of warning signal saying something is wrong, and that is pain. You as a practitioner, just observe that. You don't delve into it, and what pain is, is exactly that. It's simply a warning signal that something's not right. Some of the latest findings in, clinical re in um, the clinical research of pain, uh, I'd highly recommend you going and looking at Lorimer Mos uh, Mosley's work. He's a top scientist um, in South Australia uh, who, he, who looks into pain and what he has found is that pain is simply a warning signal. But if we use it as our reference point, we can slow down the healing process for that person quite a lot. We can slow the healing process down. So by not concentrating on pain, but concentrating on the few things that I'm going to explain next, you'll be able to improve the healing process for these people. In your subjective, what you want to determine, we don't want to talk about pain, what we want to determine is what they can't achieve. What can't this athlete achieve? When uh, who was it? Mr. Jones. When Mr. Jones, oh no, Mr. Smith. When Mr. Smith comes in and they say, Casal, I've got this low back pain. That's fine, you've got the low back pain. What I ask next is, okay, what is this pain stopping you from doing? What is this pain stopping you from achieving? That is far more important to me. They've got the pain. But what I'm trying to get is objective tests that this person can't do. So they might say, you know what, Kasal? I've got this pain. The things I can't do, I can't walk upstairs. I can't run. I can't enjoy my sport. So then I delve into it a little bit more. What kind of sport do you play? Well, I'm a soccer player. And as a soccer player, I need to do a lot of changing direction work. And... I can't do that, I can't run in a straight line, um, and I can't do any uh, ball handling skills, or I can't really dribble the ball because of the pain. Already I've worked out functional tests that this person can't achieve. That is quite crucial. Why? Because now I get a baseline of where they're at. They can't walk up the stairs, they can't dribble the ball, they can't run in a straight line, and they can't do any changing direction work. What I'd like to challenge you with is you want to try and make that objective as well. If I use the steps as an example, say, well, the person can't go up steps. Can they go up one step? Can they go up two steps? Or is it only after the fifth step that they have to give up? You've then got a very good objective score on something subjective that they say. Once again, it's nothing about the pain. The next thing is you want to determine what difficulties they have. They might be able to go up the 10 flight of stairs, but usually they might do it with, much, with ease. They don't really have to think about it. They say, Kasal, I do the 10 steps up the flight. I don't have any issues whatsoever. But now, because of my pain, I have to slow it down a bit. So, okay, so we determine difficulty. What does difficulty mean? Difficulty means that they're doing something in a decreased time period. Uh, difficulty means they have to change their uh, behavior or they're changing their functional movements. 
they might need to use the <coughs> they might need to use the banister to go up. They might need to usually they might be able to go up the stairs in let's make up a number 10 seconds. Now the 10 stairs it takes them 35 seconds. Once again you've gotten some you've gotten some very good information. You've got very good objective information because you know what their difficulties are. Okay? So going back, less emphasis on pain. As you can see, just by asking these questions on functional or functionality, you have not worried about pain as much. You're concentrating on the things that they can't achieve, things that they're having difficulties with. Next, you want to see what they want to achieve in on day one, you want to see what they want to achieve in week one, you want to see what they want to achieve in after the first month, and you also want to ask what they want to achieve in one year. If you're serious about being a sports medicine practitioner, you want to work out what your athlete wants to gain after that day. Simple question, what would you like to achieve today? Thank you for coming in and seeing me. What would you like to achieve today? And that is part of the, one of the major subjective questions uh, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend you ask. You'll get a lot of feedback about what that person wants to get out of that single session. That will allow you to provide that, either provide it or work out a system or a plan on providing that on that first day. Because if you can't provide it, at least you're one, being upfront about it, two, you're creating a pathway to it, and three, if you are able to deliver it, the person obviously is getting a result, and you're getting a result for that person. Very crucial. And the same process you do for week, uh, after one week, one month, and one year. I know a lot of excellent practitioners who pretty much do up to about week 12. Uh, you know, they might do up to three months, but they tend to avoid uh, tend to avoid what they have to do after one year. If initially you w work out what this person wants to achieve over a 12 month period, you can be the conduit to help that person achieve that and you're creating a plan to do that. <clears throat> so avoid pain, we're looking at the difficulties they have, the things that they can't achieve, the things they want to achieve, and then, as I said before, you want to make everything very objective. Okay? You're trying to determine objectivity the scale that I highly recommend you use, and you can use this scale for any test, is the patient-specific functional scale. Um, if you're unsure, you can Google it. The patient-specific functional scale is 10 tests or 10 functional tests. You rate them out of 10. Zero being the person cannot achieve it. 10 out of 10 is a perfect score. And when you add it all up, you obviously get a score for that day. <clears throat> With the patient-specific functional scale, the traditional one, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got something in my throat. <clears throat> With the patient-specific functional scale, with the traditional one, you ask a question. And you say, uh, Mr. Smith, walking up 10 stairs, and normally it's 10 out of 10, what is it today? They'll give you that score. Now, to be very objective, I'd like you to create that score. I'd like you to watch them doing that, and you're comparing, you're obviously comparing previous times you've seen people climb stairs, but I'd like you to get an idea of you scoring them. 
because that makes you the scientist. You're pulling out all the information to make decisions. That's what scientists do. So as a person climbs the stairs, you think, hmm, they're a little bit slow. They need a little bit of support. Okay, I'm going to note those things down. The speed was this, holding onto the banister as they're climbing the stairs. Okay, well, if 10 out of 10 is them going up these stairs comfortably, there's obviously, uh, you know, uh, movement patterns that are not right. Uh, they're really holding onto this banister, and if they didn't, well, they'd be really struggling getting up there. You think, all right, if 10 out of 10 was perfect, zero, this person can't do it. I'm going to give this person a score of five. When you score this, I'd like to, uh, what I suggest you do is give it a score, and then you can say, okay, Mr. Jones, I just want to ask you, I've given you scores. I'm not going to show you this to you just yet. Let me ask you where you think you're at. And you say, alright, zero, you can't do it. Ten out of ten, you're doing it perfectly. You tell me now. What do you think? And they might say, yeah, look, you know, normally I'd be a ten, but today I feel I'm about a six. Or they might say, oh, today I'm about a five. Or they might say, oh, today I'm, I'm actually about a three. But it gives you a lot of information, even before asking them, and you've gotten yourself a reference point first. That is crucial, because you've been able to get the baseline yourself and then compare it to what they say. So try that. That will be really helpful for you, and it'll help improve your skills in objectivity. It'll help improve your skills in watching something and going, oh... You know, uh, I've seen this happen uh, a few thousand times now. Yeah, the, usually it's about a 10, but today, you know, it's, it is about a 3. And you get better at being objective. So try it. So those were the main things I'd recommend you focus on in the subjective. Next is the objective. Neural dynamic testing. This is one of the latest things um, that's come out in sports medicine, uh, sports physiotherapy, in musculoskeletal physiotherapy. Uh, it's something that I'm very, very fortunate to have learned uh, over the last four years. It is something that I've been implementing into my objective tests that are getting exceptional results. Neural dynamic testing, um, this form, so it's called NDTs. In this form, in this, in this form, it's not taught at university or the undergrad or the postgrad uh, system just yet. And I believe uh, within a short period of time, it will be, in, it will start in or start to be taught. Um, it was derived uh, and founded by. Uh, a wonderful physio by the name of Michael Bridgeway, um, who's in Queensland, Australia. He's the founder of the Ridgeway Method, which is one of the latest clinical reasoning processes in Australia. And also he's the founder of the Ridgeway Method Institute. With the uh, neural dynamic testing, uh, I'd highly recommend you go onto his website. There's a video that shows how this is done. It's a video that shows uh, what tests there are in the neuro, uh, neural dynamic uh, testing side of things. Uh, sorry, I lost my wording all of a sudden. So with the neural dynamic test, there's three distinct tests that you use. There's the upper limb, lower limb, and one for the complete system. He shows this on um, a live client. Uh, it's, a, it's a video. Uh, so go and have a look at it. It'll explain a lot. This has allowed me personally to decrease the healing time um, or to improve the healing time uh, by anywhere between 25 to even 50% uh, with some of my athletes. And it is, as I said, it's not a test that is shown uh, as much as it should be, but it is brand new too. 
So please start using it. Um, I've been able to use it uh, quite a lot now and I've been fortunate enough to have learned it over the last four years. So it has made a big difference. Uh, I highly recommend you do that. Um, something else I just wanted to, uh, uh, I nearly forgot, but uh, something I wanted to say was if there was a problem with the, the neural structures um, in terms of flexibility, there's uh, the treatment process for it is called uh, LV mobilizations created by a specialist physiotherapist uh, who has passed away now, Brian Elvey. And um, this LV mobilization technique allows you to fix this if you find there's a problem. Uh, once again, Michael actually shows this process on his website. Uh, I, I'd highly recommend you have a look at it. In the past, <clears throat> when people were learning, uh, and even at university, people were recommended to look at two joints above and two joints below a problem. For example, if Mr. Jones came in, Mr. Smith came in, they had a knee problem, what we'd find and what we were taught was to look two joints above the knee and two joints below the knee. Because traditionally, that's probably the extent of where the problem could be coming from. What I can share with you now is, and something that I do, I totally ignore two joints above, two joints below. I go further up. I actually check all the joints above and I check all the joints below. And I check it all in an objective manner. Because I'm not 100% sure whether something that could be just three joints up might not contribute to the problem in the knee. So therefore I don't dismiss it. I always go and have a look at things well above, well below, and if you're unsure and if that, if by me saying this you think, oh hang on, this is what I've been taught at uni, that's fine, this, this is what I was taught at uni as well, but the reason why I started getting exceptional results was I started dismissing just looking at two joints. I started looking at everything and looking at everything in an objective way. I started being a scientist. I started avoiding talking about pain. I started looking at things in a very objective manner. Oh wow, that joint is really stiff. Or wow, that muscle is really tight. Now, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in the next slide but if you're uncomfortable doing this try three joints above try three joints below and see what kind of results you get when you start looking at joints well above and well below these are the main things you'll look at you'll look at muscles you'll look at joints you'll look at ligaments uh, you'll look at special tests, you know, for example, the Lockman's uh, in, for an ACL is a special test. And you look at functional movements. How Mr. Jones goes up the stairs is a functional test. But you are being, once again, you're being very objective about it. How tight is that muscle? What does normal muscle feel like? Giving that a score. Is that a tight joint? Is it a lax joint? Once again, you're giving it a score. Ligaments, the same. Tight ligaments or slightly lax ligaments? Give it a score. Learn to give it a score. What I tend to do is I give it a score from either, I give it a score from zero to 10. 10 out of 10 being perfect, zero is the worst thing that I've ever seen and I run through. Special tests are the same. When you are grading your special tests, learn to give things scores. And same with the functional tests. 
be, with your objective test, you need to measure everything. You need to work out what the baseline is because at date one, where you've seen, first seen the person, to date two, you can say, oh wow, you know, your muscles are no longer as tight. Your joints are no longer as tight. Or no, sorry, no longer as stiff. Muscles are no longer as tight. Joints are no longer as stiff. Um, going back to the muscles, the muscles no longer as weak. So the weakness has improved because it's stronger. Functional tests have improved. So the person can walk up the steps in 15 seconds, not 35. But you can only ever do that if you measure it. So please take the time to measure it because you're getting the crucial information. So is your athlete and they know what you're trying to improve. You don't know whether something's improved if you can't measure it. And how do you do that? You can use technology. In this day and age, you have your iPhones, you have uh, uh, your iPhones with the videos on it, uh, you have um, the iPads with the videos on it, and if someone's walking up the stairs, you can actually video them. You can video them with their phone and say, Mr. Jones, I'm going to video you walking up. And they walk up, they're a bit slower, they're holding onto the banister, and they come back down, you can show them. Say, look, this is what I'm seeing. Next week, after doing the treatment and after doing the exercises that you've prescribed, all of a sudden, let's do this again, Mr. Smith. Off they go. This time, they might be just holding onto the banister once or twice, they're going up faster, it's only, you know, they've only taken 15 seconds, they can see the improvement but you've used technology to improve that. <clears throat> there is now an app that allows, uh, that you don't have to use a goniometer anymore. The app is on your iPhone. Uh, one of the leading surgeons who I've had the opportunity to work with in Melbourne, um, Dr. Alte Altantis, who's a terrific hip and knee surgeon in Melbourne, uh, I highly recommend him, he's a, he's a wonderful chap. Um, he said, Kasal, I, I don't have a goni. What I do have is an app that allows me to measure different movements using technology. So there's a lot of things out there. Um, use technology for you to become objective. So that was the subjective. Uh, sorry, that was the objective. So we finished the subjective and objective. Next is the analysis. With the analysis, you want to prioritize what you found with your objective. With that list of muscles, joints, ligaments, special tests, functional tests, you'll work out what is the worst. In my experience, the worst one usually has been the major contributor to a problem. So to put that into perspective, person comes in with back pain and they say, Kasal, I can't walk up the stairs, I can't tie my shoelaces. And the major contributing factor to that might have been a tight gluteal muscle. Because with my list of things, I found that the tight gluteal muscle was right at the top. And what I've learned to do is to treat that first. Now, treating that, uh, more often than not, treating the worst possible sign has gotten me very good results. But I wouldn't be able to do that unless I prioritise. So with uh, young therapists that I see or students that I have, I tell them, prioritise it. Prioritise. You come back to me and tell me what do you think is the worst. I don't want you to tell me what your patient or what your athlete thinks is the worst, I want you to tell me what you think is the worst. Because you are the scientist. You've pulled that information out. That's the key. Prioritize. 
You be the scientist. As I said, you're pulling the information out yourself. You are the professional. You are the expert. You've done all this training. You would have done four years, seven years uh, of training just to get to this level. That's four to seven years more than your athlete. That's four to seven years more than the regular person coming in off the street and saying, I've got a back problem. So you be the scientist. You pull out the information. You pull out the information. That's the analysis. You've done the subjective, pulled the information out, objectified it. You've done the objective tests. You've looked at the nerves, muscles, joints, ligaments, special tests, functional tests. Then you've analyzed it. You've prioritized it. By how have you prioritized? You've said, hmm. Well, the muscles are a bit tight, the glutes are a bit tight, the neural testing is not as good, um, the functional tests aren't good. Those are the major ones. So that's your top three. Then you've looked at the subjective and one of the major things they can't do is can't walk up the stairs. And in the first question they would have said, well, Today, Kasal, I'd really like to work out how to walk upstairs. I'd really like to work out. I'd really, one thing I'd like to learn today is how can I walk up the stairs without my back hurting? That comes in the treatment. The treatment, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about our findings from the subjective and the objective, the analysis. In the treatment, what I'd like you to target is a 10 to 20 percent improvement after each session how do you achieve that the key is to have this statement in your mind the key is to think how am i going to get the best result in the shortest period of time during my career and even now i keep saying to myself what can i do to get the best result in the shortest period of time by always thinking that way, I'm always trying to find new things or a new technique or a new treatment uh, methodology, a new clinical reasoning process that's going to help me get this after each session. If I'm getting a 1% change or a 2% change, me personally, that's not good enough for me. I really like to target myself I aim for 30 to 50% after each session. That's a measure of an objective test improving by 30 to 50% after each session. But by targeting 10 to 20%, you're making your way to it. You're really getting yourself out there and you're trying to do your very best. And we're getting closer to you know our findings from the subjective objective um, the analysis I'm getting there so just bear with me for the next two slides and I'll show you how it'll piece together <clears throat> the old way of doing it was we treated we reassessed objective findings the person went home they would then test their function and then we would reassess upon our next visit. So, I've been able to treat them, reassess, they go home, test function, and reassess upon the next visit. That is the old way. The new way is this. And I'm very happy to share this with you because it cuts down a few steps and, oops, Thought I'd press the wrong button. Try oh, I did. We're back onto this one. The new way is to cut down a few steps and get the best result in a shorter period of time. How did I do that? First, I treat. 
I don't worry about reassessing, but I'll, I'll talk about why I don't reassess there. I reassess a little bit later. I treat, we cross out reassessment, we cross out going home for now. This is all in one session, by the way. I test function while treating. Okay? Then I cross out reassessment upon next visit because. I've been able to do what someone does over two sessions in about half a session on the same day. So you might say, Casal, how do you treat and test function all together? You can achieve that by, by treating the worst objective sign. So that symbol is the asterisk sign. So treating the worst asterisk or the worst objective sign I have been able to help function. So this is how it, it pieces together. I've worked out that in my list, the person has a very tight glute. Um, say there's a whole bunch of other asterisks that are there, but the tight glute is the worst one. By treating it, I want to test the function right there and then too. The functional test with Mr. Jones was climbing the stairs. So what I'd like to do is combine those two. To combine those two, a tight glute, you want to be treating it with a technique which is um, a muscle release technique, a muscle release with movement, you could call it. So a muscle release technique for the glute would be a deep tissue technique. How do you do a deep tissue technique and check for the functional status at the same time? What you need to do is use a treatment directional test. The treatment, a deep tissue technique, it could be, uh, say, uh, a type of trigger point release or the worst part of that muscle is very tight, so there's a release that you need to administer to it. If you apply that, and they do their functional test, that is called a treatment directional test. It's a TDT. Now, a TDT allows you to work out whether you're on track or not. Meaning, it's an easy process seeing a person walk up the stairs, you find the tightest part of the glute and you apply a pressure, you apply the treatment and all you need to do is check that functional test. If you've hit the right asterisk sign, so I'll go back to this, if you've hit the right one, you should find the functional test should improve by this amount at least. So this is how you piece it all together. <clears throat> Let me go back. So we're treating something and we're testing function at the same time. To do that we need to work out the worst asterisk sign. Once you work out the worst asterisk sign you treat it and you do the functional test at the same time. This allows you to do two things. It shows you're on track and more importantly, it shows your patient you're on track. You're on track because, say on your list there was a tight glute, there was a, a lumbar segment that was hypomobile, it was quite stiff, and let's say that's the L4. Back in the day, this is what could have happened. Back in the day, a person would get treated for their L4, Excuse me. Uh, they get treated for their L4, they get reassessed, and okay, well that hypomobile joint is not hypomobile anymore, it's quite okay now. Alright, great. Go home. They can test function at home, you know, the stairs, they can test the stairs at home. They can reassess upon next visit. But if it was the glute that was the actual problem, 
you wouldn't be able to work that out until you get them back. So treating them, ultimately, you can do this too. So, this is what I'd recommend. What you're trying to do is, you're treating, and you don't have to reassess, because if they can do their functional test, you're well on track. That's what this is. By treating the L4 and they're climbing up the stairs, you can, you can do a treatment on uh, joints. They're called mobilizations with movements. Uh, people like Brian Mulligan's work uh, is famous for showing how mobilizations uh, can work with movement. So by all means, it is possible, and you can admit uh, you can administer a mobilization to any joint in the body with movement. So one thing here is that let's go back to the L4. You're treating the L4 with a mobilization. They're climbing up the stairs, and you think, hmm, not bad. It certainly has improved, but the improvement is only five percent because you're measuring how long it's going to take them to get up there. Secondly, you try the glute, because that's prioritized as well, and it's high on the list. You treat it, and all of a sudden the improvement is far better, because functionally the per person can walk up a lot faster, their normal movement patterns are returning, they don't have to use the banister as much, that allows you to realize which one you need to target first, which problem area you need to hit first. And you haven't wasted two days to get to this result, you've gotten it within one session. That is how I was able to get all my great results very, very quickly. This whole process is one of the newest clinical reasoning processes called the Ridgeway method. Um, Michael Ridgeway, as I said, he's got some exceptional material on his website. If you ever get the opportunity to um, say hello to him, uh, by all means, uh, say that Casal said hi as well, and you know you heard about him through me. Um, he's a very good friend of mine, and uh, he's he's a wonderful, practical. Uh, very intelligent physiotherapist who has gone out of his way to help the profession to help the profession in leaps and bounds and um, his uh, his material is groundbreaking uh, it takes uh, it takes you to another level as a practitioner so I highly recommend looking at his stuff some of these things I'm explaining are such a small portion of what his teachings are but these are the major things within the subjective within the objective within the analysis within the treatment and I'll be talking to you about some of the stuff uh, just after this as well on um, the education side which I have found that could help you so going back to TDTs uh, sorry I get sidetracked and I start talking uh, uh, I, I really enjoy uh, sports physio and I really enjoy the, the teaching side. So please, if you, if you think I'm waffling, this is nothing. I can waffle on for longer. But uh, back to this. Um, TDTs shows you're on track. It also shows your patient you're on track. So going back to the five elements, we've done the first four the final one is education. The four important factors in education are exercises, the advice that you give, prevention, and the final one is when do you want to see that person back. Uh, I've seen that missed out on countless times where you've done the treatment, great, that's fine, treatment's done, uh, the person's gotten a result, and the physio simply forgets to say, well, I'd like to see you back in two days' time. I'd like to see you back in three days' time, five days' time, whatever it is. 
you need to let them know when to return. The exercise and advice, so these first two components, exercise and advice, these are the six uh, things that you should keep in mind. The exercise should be focused onto a certain area, so if you found that by treating the glute, excuse me, by treating the glute the person can improve their functionality of going up the stairs, then that is the exercise, that's the area that you want to exercise. So that's very focused. It has to be relevant because by treating the glute, it improves their function. Uh, if you said to me, Casal, I found the glute was the tightest part. It, by treating it, we got a very good result uh, going up the stairs. Uh, but, uh, you know, I want to give this person some exercises to loosen up the lumbar spine. I'm thinking, well, why is that relevant? How is that relevant? So, relevance. Exercises have to be safe. If you're unsure whether they're going to be safe with the exercises, test them out before they leave your clinic. Test them out before you go, uh, before they leave. Dosage is very crucial. You need to let the, that person know how many times a day they need to exercise how many exercises they should do. Um, they should be able to, <clears throat> they should be able to see how many reps, uh, how many sets, how many times a day, something else people miss. How long do you want them to do those exercises for? When you go to a doctor and you've got a flu, and you've got a, a chest infection, they might give you antibiotics. They'll say you take a tablet in the morning, tablet at night, take it after food, or take it with food, and you take it for seven days, I'll see you after seven days. Very clear, very informative, focused, relevant, safe, and they've given you the dosage. Start thinking of providing exercise in the same way. Because if you're not, you're not doing a service for your athlete. Time based, exactly as I said with the doctor, you know, they'll say, come and see me after five days after t taking this medicine. The medicine, the medicine you give are your exercises. So the person should realize how important that is. The key to their rehab or the key to their improvement is the medicine, the exercise you give. So if you can stress that importance, you're well on track. It's very good. And obviously clear instructions. The times that I've seen where things are not clear, and by all means use technology now. Um, look, gone are the days where you have to draw these things, okay? You might even get them a printout, but start using technology. With their iPhone, you film them doing the exercise. How amazing is that? You film them doing the exercise and you say, while filming, you're going to do 20 reps, you're going to do three sets, you're going to do it in the morning and you're going to do it in the evening. You're going to do this for the next five days and after that, I will see you. It's all there. No wasting time drawing stuff, printing things out, everything. Just use technology to do that. It'll be amazing and your athletes will love it because they can go home and see themselves. Athletes also love watching uh, how they improve. So they'll do that exercise and then in a week's time, they'll, you'll get a chance to film them again and that's being objective and you'll be able to see. They'll be able to see how they improve. So use that. Prevention. In prevention, you want to show them how to keep the asterisk signs that you found, those objective signs that you found, muscles, joints, ligaments, nerves, special tests, functional tests. You want to show them how to keep that normal. And if you can show them how to keep that normal using this, you've done your job. Because if they can do this, 
you're helping them lead a healthier life. When to return. When should they come back and see you? You have to determine that. Don't let your athlete determine that. You are the scientist. You need to let them know when you want to see them back. With some elite athletes, I've seen them in the morning. Then they'll go to their training and I'll say, I'll need to see you back in the afternoon as well because I need to make sure that the functional tests that we've achieved in the afternoon have improved. Or you've sustained that or you've maintained that. So there's got to be a reason on when you get them back. There's got to be a reason why you want them back. And to do that, you need to be open, you need to be direct, and you need to give reasons. But always do this. If you don't do this, you're doing a disservice to yourself because you don't know how, in, how much improvement you've helped this person by. Because you could say, great, after the first session, we got 100%. Awesome, I think I've done my job. And I'll say, well, just come back if, if, I, if uh, there's a problem or you know, if you go backwards. I'd like you to really cement what you've done with that person and really cement your knowledge by saying, look, I'd like to see you one more time anyway because I want to make sure that what I've done has sustained it. And because you're open and you're helping them out, you're making sure you're going you're going the extra mile by saying that they will really appreciate it <clears throat> you are the scientist you determine this so these are the five elements as I said there's nothing I've recreated here but within each one of these there are new things that are happening there are new things that uh, new things that are going on, there's new things that I've worked out, there's patterns that I've learned along the way. Uh, you know, after 35,000 treatments in sport alone, you tend to work out what these patterns are. And you tend to work out uh, the things that work and things that don't work. Now, I'm glad that I've been able to share that with you today. So what to keep in mind? What to keep in mind now that you've heard this lecture, what should you keep in mind? I need you to back yourself. Um, have the confidence with what you've learned is something very special. What you've learned is something that not many people in the world have had the opportunity to learn. Not many people have had the opportunity to learn about the body, how it works. And not many people have that opportunity to work with athletes as well. So back yourself, be the scientist, be the person that has learned all this and now you're pulling out information. I talk about it being a scientist because a scientist is someone who's learned something, they're an expert and they're pulling out information to make them better. But you get the opportunity to help people along the way. So you're a special scientist. Not, I'm not saying that scientists don't get that opportunity, but you know what I mean. Also, what to keep in mind is you have to be able to guide your patient. Um, the person comes in here, that's your baseline. You know they want to achieve 10 out of 10. And you're saying, I'm going to take you along this path. This is how I'm going to do it. You're in control, you're guiding that person. You're the expert, you're the scientist. So they ultimately are listening to you because you're the professional. And you're the person who has, who is able to make a difference for them. Back yourself, be the scientist, guide your patient. Keep that in mind. Something to, just to be aware, 
this lecture covered a lot of material it was very in depth in some areas some brand spanking new stuff um, that you might not have heard or some things that may be quite annoying because it's different to what you've learned at uni what I can share is these are the things that have worked for me and these are the things that are working uh, with my current team um, these are the things that uh, myself and my current team are doing to help all the elite athletes at the University of Melbourne uh, we've got um, a list of 24 elite athletes who are Olympians, Winter Olympians, national level champions uh, on top of that we've got uh, 200 national level athletes that we take care of personally as well there was a lot of information here that we use to help our athletes if it's overwhelming try looking at some of the aspects of the of the lecture and pull out the ones that really resonated with you if something resonated with you you'd hear it and you think hmm I like the sound of that that sounds very interesting go and delve into that into that in in more depth so the ones that you were a little bit unsure of just avoid that for now you can always come back to that and um, I'm planning on putting out a lot more of these lectures um, so you get to see um, a lot of my teachings online um, I'm putting a lot of information out there to hold seminars and workshops and um, I, I mean I, I love this stuff I really love um, sharing this message I really love to show practitioners how they can be better at what they do um, it really excites me uh, so you know don't be confused if there's a few things in this lecture that are uh, you're unsure of because as we go along there will be other things that will help clear that but start with the ones where you thought start with the ones where you thought well yeah that that was really interesting uh, I like that start with those ones first and put these little steps into play so the three things that um, I should do next so the three things that um, I as a practitioner you as a practitioner what should you do next be objective be very objective be objective in your subjective be objective in your objective be objective in your treatment be objective in your analysis sorry and then be objective in your treatment be objective in the education side as well you want to try and start assessing function during treatment um, what this means is the TDT you want to try and do the TDT process where you're treating and adding that to a function um, you're treating you're treating and then you're adding the function and combining that because that gives you a step ahead you, you become a step ahead of the people who treat go home come back let's reassess uh, you treat test function then you can go into it a bit more depth right there so just the example of the person who okay we have found the glute improved the stairs the treatment doesn't stop there what you've figured out is that is one of the major spots that is getting a result then you say all right looks like the glutes are a major spot let's get you lying on the bed let's really get into this area and work into it loosen it all up and then you can reassess straight away so what you would what traditionally therapists took over two to three sessions you'd be achieving in less than a half and that is very powerful and I'm very confident that you'll be able to achieve these results what, I, what I'd like you to do is share your stories of these achievements if you try any of this out please you'll get an opportunity to write a few notes down underneath this video 
please leave me a message. I'd love to hear about it. I'd love for you to share your story of success with an athlete or a patient or a difficult scenario that you had in the past and then all of a sudden you've done something from this video and you've gone, oh wow, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's helpful, or it's been helpful. So I'd, I'd like you to share that with me, please. I'd love to hear your success story. The final thing I'd highly recommend you do is provide exercises with the six criteria I talked about. If you start doing that, uh, you become an, a com you, you you become complete as a therapist. And um, just by doing these three things as the first few steps, uh, it'll give you the momentum to go in deeper with some of the other things I talked about. So. Thank you very much for listening. I, uh, I have really enjoyed bringing this lecture to you. Um, I'm looking forward to bringing more uh, in the future. Uh, as I said, um, this has taken me a long or many, many years of understanding, practice, uh, a lot of heartache because there were some scenarios where I'd be getting results but I'm not always getting consistent results <clears throat> by putting all of these things together it has allowed me to get that consistency getting extremely good results and these are the things I'd like to share with you because they're the things that have worked for me uh, Please share your stories of success with me. I'd love to hear about it. I wish you well. Go out there and share your experience and knowledge with as many people as possible. Your, with your guidance, uh, your expertise, you're able to help so many people out of pain. You're able to help so many people do the things that they love because you have the knowledge. You have the framework, you have the steps and go out there, change the world and uh, please share your stories of success. I love to hear about it. Take good care and I will see you next time.